Hello everyone and welcome to Math Future. That's the phrase I always love to say. So Math Future is an international network of researchers, teachers, developers, parents, and techie people. That's all of us. We have three main interests. Communities that learn together, computer-based mathematics, and social media as it relates to mathematics and mathematics education. Since 2009, we've been organizing this live open online meetings to present projects and their leaders. And it is our chance to meet interesting people, to sample and review a variety of projects, and just to chat live with one another. And please do so right now or at any time. We do have open microphones, so when time for questions co uh, comes, I hope everybody uh, speaks and uh, asks a lot of questions. You can also type questions at any time in the chat, and I will fish them out later. So today, I'm very happy to present Liam Nielsen and his project called Ender Initiative. Now, Liam will talk in just a minute about uh, Ender and how it came to be. I just want to say, for my part, I'm very interested in how self-organized learning uh, can deal with mathematics. A lot of people say, we can unschool everything except for mathematics. A lot of people say, well, you have to have hierarchical top-down structures for mathematics. And so I'm always interested in uh, how uh, more open environments use mathematics in their work. And so I'm going to present Liam now. And please tell us how you started, what Ender is, and uh, how things are in there. Cool. Uh, thank you for having me, Maria. Um, uh, so, um, Indoor started <clears throat> in 2010. Um, I, I grew up unschooled um, as a self-directed learner. I never went to any kind um, any kind of school. Um, and as a teenager, um, I kind of discovered network unschooling. So. Um, I, I didn't know that many other unschoolers when I was growing up. Um, then as a teenager, I, I met uh, many others at various kind of gatherings of them, like Not Back to School Camp up in Vermont. And there's a lot of unschooling conferences across the coast. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and so I started um, the Indoor Initiative um, then in 2010, and we had a couple of just events up in the Northeast. Here's a picture of one of them. Um, there's just kind of like gatherings of, of teenage unschoolers. Um, um, and I, I kind of had this dream of, of turning it into a type of school down the line. Um, and eventually, I moved to Asheville, North Carolina where <clears throat> I started the indoor initiative as kind of like a pop-up school without walls type of um, network. So here's a picture of, um, of Math Jam, which is an event that we had. I'll, I'll talk more about this later. Um, we would meet in kind of various different locations for different classes. Uh, this is a uh, like chocolate, chocolate cafe where we used to have yeah, Math Jam. Um, after a year, this is um, 2013 to 2014, we kind of existed in this state. Um, in in um, early 2014, we ended up getting a space. We moved into um, an old dance studio um, right here that was empty during the day. So we kind of had a schoolhouse for people to come in and direct their own self-organized learning, so to speak, um, which kind of gave it a very different flavor than when we met at different locations. Um, after we were here for about six months, we moved to Open Space Asheville, which is a um, kind of community center project over on the west side where we share space with a maker space, a tool library, um, adults co-working. Um, here's a, a picture of uh, the core team having a meeting in there. Um, 
And so um, our kind of approach to, to math starting out, um, when we were still kind of back in this phase, um, was that most of the participants <coughs> were really math averse. Um, and uh, and so actually at a conference, um, I spoke with Maria about, um, we were just talking about math in general, and we were talking about how so many people need math therapy. So um, so I thought we should have a day of math therapy. Um, so we had uh, one class where we, we used to meet in this kind of conference room um, where everybody kind of went around and talked about their fear, shame, and anxiety around math. Um, since uh, what I've observed with a lot of um, unschoolers and homeschoolers um, is that they're like, comfortable with, with numbers to a certain extent, and then um, at some point they start to fall behind uh, where their peers are in this kind of linear um, understanding of, of numbers. Um, and then instead of pushing themselves to catch up, so to speak, they uh, kind of just plug their ears and, and pretend like it's totally unnecessary to them and they're better than math, they don't need it, it's stupid anyway, um, and, and kind of forget about it. So, um, so we had this math therapy day for everybody to just kind of talk about that. Um, and I got, um, uh, oh, um, I got a good friend of mine named Ethan um, who really got me excited about math when I was a teenager to come in and, um, and talk a little bit about his relationship to math because he has this really kind of healthy, positive math um, vibe. Um, and everybody really liked it at the end of the day. We talked about a lot of interesting concepts. We talked about different kinds of um, infinity. And, um, and from then on, out every Tuesday, we had Math Jam at the French Broad Chocolate Lounge, where um, the point of Math Jam was less to learn math and more to learn positive math habits. Um, to kind of associate math with hanging out in this cafe, drinking hot chocolate, um, and like playing with Rubik's cubes and doing Sudoku's, rather than <clears throat> stressing about uh, like their their school peers testing them on their multiplication tables and that kind of thing. Um, so that um, that was Math Jam. Once we moved um, over here and then over here. Um, math Jam was kind of um, dropped for a while, and um, since some people found it hard to um, to not uh, or to, to focus on math work when there were so many other things going on, since we didn't have like one set location um, each week to do math stuff. Um, but then it started kind of coming back uh, in a bunch of different forms. Um, we started reading Godel Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstadter and like exploring the um, you know, kind of uh, formal systems and, and different theories in that book uh, that a lot of people have gotten really into. <clears throat> um, there, uh, there, there are a lot of people interested in games, so I always kind of talk about kind of game theory concepts and that kind of thing. Um, but I try really hard not to um, not to get too like uh, pushy when I talk about math concepts. I try to kind of just like bring them up as if you know, as if they're a natural thing to talk about because they are, um, and less of like a and, and you should do math too. Um, and uh, and a lot of people do Khan Academy. That's <clears throat> mostly what people did at. Um, at Math Jam, we would kind of get together and everybody would do their own math work. Um, some people uh, have outside math tutors, and since Endor is only open three days a week, and we're not a we're not a school, we're just kind of a self-directed learning center. Um, so people would um, you know, work on Khan Academy stuff, 
or they would just sit and do math puzzles and that kind of thing, or like even do um, origami and that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, but as it stands right now, um, mostly people do, you know, what is considered like schoolwork at Endor only as it relates to projects or work that they're doing. Um, so this, you know, includes like writing and pretty simple math. There's, there's a um, finances working group where uh, a lot of, some of the participants manage some of the funds that we have. Um, and they have, like come up with their own accounting systems. Um, there's uh, a few people that are really into coding um, so they're doing like Code Academy stuff, but there again, it's just specifically as it relates to like video game design, which is really popular. Um, otherwise, um, yes, yeah, several participants see a, a math tutor on off days that's um, that's really into um, like sacred geometry, um, which um, which some of them are really into and like actually get excited to talk about. Um, and tell their friends about, which always makes me happy. Um, otherwise, we kind of work in math concepts, like in, in art jams, we'll um, work with the Fibonacci sequence and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we actually just ended um, on, on Friday. Those are our last day. Um, but um, I suppose kind of the the, the biggest way we um, I mean, work math in is just specifically how it relates to what people are already doing. Um, and I would like to see more people kind of uh, exploring mathematics concepts purely out of interest. Um, and people are starting to kind of move in that direction. Um, towards the end of the year, when we were getting really into the um, Gerdella Scherbach, um, I lent out uh, copy of um, finite and infinite games <clears throat> to kind of come back to next fall. Um, but that um, that is us. Um, yeah, should, uh, should I give you some questions? Yeah, Larry? there were several in chat, in fact, that I'm going to pass on to you because people typed them up as they went. So one was from John. And, um, the question was, uh, it's from something you said earlier about unschooling and homeschooling. Are these the same things, unschooling and homeschooling? Oh, sorry about that, John. Um, homeschooling and unschooling are, are fairly different. Um, homeschooling is is often like school at home, um, where some some people even like wear uniforms and do the Pledge of Allegiance, whereas unschooling is very self-directed. and um, and it's very much left up to the um, to the child or what they want to spend their time on um, with you know ideas and, and help from their parents, but less kind of instruction from their parents. But really, all kind of homeschooling and unschooling families usually kind of walk the line between the two. Excellent. So the next question was from Terry. Where did the name Endor come from? Uh, um, it, um, this is kind of a funny story. Um, it, it, we just wanted the, um, the name of kind of a, like, mythical place. Um, so, um, uh, Endor is a really old word. Um, it's, it's from some, um, Bible story, but it was used in Star Wars. Um, most recently in pop culture, and so um, the name the name came from there. Star Wars, yay! So, what does it mean? I'm going to just um, uh, ask some more. Uh, I where, wherever the name came from originally, by now it probably acquired some lore from your people. <laughs> Did it? What do what does it mean now for you? Oh, Endor? Um, uh, well, there there's, is kind of a funny story. I, um, um, a friend of mine and I used to teach this, um, this workshop called Putting an Unschooler on the Moon. Um, 
which was all about this concept of, of there's network unschoolers and then there's kind of lone wolf unschoolers and network unschoolers spend a lot of time, and I'm talking about teenagers here, spend a lot of time um, traveling long distances to, to spend time with each other. Um, and when I was a teenager, I observed that there's kind of two ways it could go. It could go like one way where, um, you know, you'd visit somebody and you'd spend a lot of time like hanging out, maybe, you know, watching movies and eating pizza. And at the end of the, at the end of the weekend or week, it really didn't feel that fulfilling. Um, but a good friend of mine, Elijah Blanton, and I um, spent a lot of time visiting each other. We both live pretty close in the, on the Northeast, um, and we would kind of start our visit um, by setting a list of goals that we wanted to achieve. And even if they were like simple, simple goals like playing Settlers of Catan um, or like doing some street art project, if at the end of the day we had accomplished the things that we set out to do, we really felt much better about ourselves and how we had spent our time, um, which um, then kind of played into this workshop, Putting an Unschooler on the Moon, which is all about how um, unschooling together can be so much better than unschooling alone, because how are you going to get an unschooler on the moon? Well, you're going to have to cooperate and, and um, have a lot of people contribute, um, which then later kind of presented itself as a joke when um, Endor in Star Wars is a moon, um, and so all the unschoolers that come to Endor are on the moon. We put a bunch of unschoolers on the moon. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of uh, what it... That's uh, some it nice sort of... lore you got. How wonderful. Yeah. I'm so glad I asked a second time. Okay. So <laughs> sometimes you get good answers the, the second time around. <laughs> Better yeah. answers. You always get good answers, but it's interesting. So all stories are interesting. Um, Chaz asks also in chat, uh, Chaz says, mass averse, uh, you say a lot of your people were mass averse. Is this an inborn trait, as in I'm just not a mass person, or is it entirely a learned attitude of behavior? I think, I personally think it's an entirely learned behavior. I think it's purely cultural. Um, I think, I mean, it has so much to do with um, with the way math is taught in schools and then how that leaks out into just culture in general and impacts, you know, kids that don't even go to school. Um, especially um, since there's, with, with especially like younger homeschooled and unschooled kids, um, they're, um, there tends to be sometimes um, a bit of like jealousy on the part of a, a kid who goes to school, and so um, they'll want to like test the, the homeschooled or unschooled kid on like you know stupid multiplication questions, um, just so they can you know prove that they're smarter than them or that like going to school really is important. Um, which I think leads to a lot of stress on the part of kind of homeschooled and unschooled kids, um, which then, you know, ends up being pretty counterproductive to their math learning down the road, but that's not, you know, the intention of um, <clears throat> whatever, a nine-year-old. Um, but I think it's totally a learned behavior, um, and I think it's, it's hard to unlearn, but um, I certainly know that it is possible. Um, yeah. And there is a related, I think, question from John um, about motivation. Uh, because some people are averse but motivated. But uh, John writes, it seems your learners are quite strongly motivated. And what if they are not? <laughs> if they are not motivated to learn mathematics specifically? John, do you want to take the microphone and talk about it? Just talk about motivation. Oh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah. Can you hear me OK? Uh, I didn't hear Liam's last question. Oh, I asked, um, do you mean motivation in learning math specifically, or just in learning in general? Uh, well, uh, I guess both, really. 
Okay, um, all right. I, I mean, just breaking the ice with uh, an individual or a group is often extremely difficult. And um, somebody who wants to learn, yes, there's lots of things you can do with Fibonacci, for example. Uh, the sort of problem learners I have in mind, I don't think I would dream uh, of getting on something like that, certainly not from an algebraic, from a computational point of view. I might get onto it from a, an artistic point of view. But I just wondered if you've got any ideas there about how about if you just get, you know, half a dozen kids, and we're you're talking about teenagers mainly, are you, who just uh, don't want to learn or don't want to learn maths or want to play football or whatever they do. Right. I think starting with, um, I mean, like leaving the kind of linear approach to, to math teaching where you start with um, with counting and then addition and then multiplication, et cetera. Um, like kind of leaving that behind and going straight to more interesting concepts, yeah, like the um, Fibonacci sequence or like um, different kinds of infinity, I mean, different like interesting numbers. Um, because, I mean, once somebody knows that it, it gets more interesting down the line if they are following this kind of linear path, um, if, if if they see what is ahead, then um, learning the concepts that explain, um, learning the kind of the simpler concepts that explain the more complicated concepts um, becomes much more meaningful. Good, okay, thank you. And um, then um, the uh, there is a related question, I think, because motivation has to do with freedom, and so John asks about uh, Paula Freire. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced the name right, uh, but uh, F R E I R E. Uh, how how does it fit in? Liam, do you do you find his work relevant? Do you know of him? You know what? I, I, I'm Paul Freire, right? Uh, I know of his work, but I must admit that I've not read any of it. Um, so I can't speak to that. I'm sorry. Okay. Can I just maybe give a sort of ten word summarize, summary of how I understand Paul Freire? Sure. Uh, which is, I mean, it's very much a political approach. I mean, he started it in West Africa. And he was saying that um, people will learn when it can affect their power situation in society. Uh, and so in that case, it was a sort of an anti-colonial struggle. But I think in a sort of working class situation here, like in, in England, I mean, I, I work with some people in their 20s who are pretty illiterate, uh, but who have financial difficulties. So starting off with things that gives them more power uh, either sort of over the budget, which is a sort of a, a rather um, um, abstract sort of power, or m m more physically giving them power over the sort of state bureaucrat who would be trying to take away their benefits or, or whatever. Now, and I think that Freire would be saying, uh, start with somebody's location in society. So to come back to teenagers who, who are reluctant, but the sort of thing that I would be inclined to do would be to try to find something that they might not regard as maths which might be, you know, building something or, or uh, pl planning a trip or something like that, which at one level is not mathematics at all, but which requires both mathematical skills but also the social skills that are necessary in order to get learning started. Great. Um, I, I mean, I believe in that to a certain extent, but I think so much of it is also cultural. Um, and so... <clears throat> um, when it comes to like making a decision about what to learn, like I mean, with all the MOOCs that are out there, there's thousands of of online courses that people can take completely for free that will change their power situation, and tons of people know that, but hardly anybody takes those courses. Um, and so um, I think a lot of the kind of motivation behind it is cultural. Um, and so, if you have a, I mean, it's, it's the same kind of thing in like a math classroom. If there's like a negative math culture, then if it's cool to be bad at math, then um, everyone is going to value wanting to be um, cool to a certain extent over um, putting putting time in to learn um, math concepts. Uh, so. 
I think they definitely have to see um, the value in it um, pretty concretely in a way that um, that kind of points at it being um, like in a in a um, like a percentage point more valuable um, than doing something else. Um, in that Hopefully, and yeah, I think particularly when you that said they have to see the value in it, I mean, that's quite a key thing. And the value can be either sort of intrinsic and immediate, or it can be longer term. But thank you very much for your comments. That was helpful. Sure. Thanks. That was a good question. So uh, please keep asking questions by chat or by microphone. If anyone would like to talk for a while, uh, just say so in chat and we'll take turns or just start speaking. And uh, the rest of us will fall silent for a bit. Um, I have a question about en Endor and this idea. Um, have you seen other entities like that around the world? I know you travel a lot. So, uh, Liam, have you, have you seen other places like that? What are they like? Or is, I know Endor is pretty unique, but are there similar things at least? Sure. Um, we actually recently <coughs> joined the Agile Learning Centers Network. Um, it's a network of, of kind of self-directed learning centers that evolved out of the free school model. Um, and they all, we all kind of follow the same structures. Um, this tool is borrowed from Agile software development, which is a facilitation process, <coughs> a kind of non-hierarchical kind of facilitation process. And, um, and so uh, every week we check in with all the different Agile Learning Centers. There's, there's, um, there's one in Manhattan, there's one in upstate New York, there's one in Seattle, there's one in, um, <clears throat> there's one in Puerto Rico, there's one opening up in Hawaii, um, there's one in Uganda opening up. And um, out of all of them, we have the oldest participants. And all of the other ones are mostly kids from like 6 to 12. Um, <clears throat> and um, and for the most part, it seems like uh, most of the kids in those schools aren't super kind of math motivated. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think like going into teenage years, that definitely changes because um, people start thinking about um, taking the SATs or getting a GED or um, getting a job where they have to kind of you know some some basic math concepts, um, and it becomes more like real and relevant to them. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday actually, um, who uh, presents at a charter school in San Francisco, where uh, it's, it's a high school where um, for ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade they have more or less kind of the same kind of math concept that we did, math jam, where <clears throat> they, each student goes in and does all the math stuff they want to do or they don't want to do. Um, but in 12th grade, before they graduate, they have to take the standardized test. And they all know that. Um, and so <clears throat> they, they all have to prepare for it, but they get to um, decide themselves how they prepare for it. Um, and I think that makes it pretty different than our situation, um, since there is no standardized test that they're going to have to take when they turn 18. Um, and there will be like real life consequences for, um, you know, not studying for the math portion of the SAT or whatever. Um, but to me, it seems pretty different. Um, and it seems like their culture at this, this school in San Francisco um, was very kind of rigorous and um, self-disciplined. Um, so um, yeah, I don't I don't know what um, yeah where I was going with that, but does that uh, kind of answer your question? There's also um, the whole North Star Model School um, <clears throat> from Northampton. That's also a very kind of self-directed learning center where there's there's no tests or grades, and it's all kind of self-directed. And then, of course, the preschool model, which I mentioned earlier, um, 
there's I think there's a free school in, in most kind of big cities in America at least. There's um, one in Brooklyn, there's one in Albany, there's one in Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles. Um, and, and they are somewhat similar to what we do, but um, with Endor and at the other Agile Learning Centers, <clears throat> instead of kind of being completely self-directed, we start each week and each day by setting intentions um, and then going out and doing what we do. And then at the end of the day, we kind of wrap it up with um, with reflecting on how we spent our time, um, which um, in my mind is ultimately much more productive than really just going at it like a like a you know bumblebee um, <clears throat> and and tasting all the flowers of knowledge. Interesting, all the flowers, <laughs> flowers, flavors. Yeah. Okay, so um, so um, there is a let me scroll up to it a bit. There is another uh, question in chat uh, that Terry had uh, that um, about completion of tasks. Maybe you can find it in chat. That uh, uh, who's helping people to get there with the end game in mind, the schedules and deadlines and completion. <coughs> oh, um, that. Um, is largely set um, by them. Um, uh, they set their own deadlines. Many of them are like kind of deadline averse too, which which um, I think really illustrates really well that if you don't work at something, then you know it, it's not going to happen. Um, which kind of plays into a, a really big value that I have is. Um, um, teaching them or them learning how to kind of set their own metrics for success and measure their own self-worth um, so that they're you know, not just thinking about setting up a life where they get a big paycheck or have a fast car, <clears throat> but, um, but some kind of life where they uh, can create their own sense of meaning. Um, and so they, yeah, they, they set their own deadlines. We meet with, we have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them where we'll talk about you know, the facilitators. There's three other facilitators um, other than myself. And we have one-on-one -on -one meetings where we talk about the kind of projects that they've taken on and um, help them set deadlines and kind of establish smaller steps for them to take. Um, but oftentimes they, um, will kind of um, if, if if the deadline they set isn't kind of real and um, dependent on an external factor, then it's often not very strong. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. So there is like another question also from Terry. Do people pay to be at Endor, and how does it work economically in general? I should ask. And yeah. Um, uh, participants pay on a sliding scale to be at Endor. Um, so the sliding scale as it stands right now, people pay between um, like $40 a month and $300 a month. Um, and then we are under a nonprofit. Uh, we're under this, uh, a nonprofit that um, that called Black Mountain Soul. If any of you are familiar with that. Um, even, and then all of the facilitators, uh, including myself, are volunteers. So um, yeah, all all of the money goes towards rent and, and resources. And we're actually doing a crowdfunding campaign right now too. Um, so that is a way that we're. Yeah, you should to, put uh, uh, your crowdfunding um, campaign in chat, and we should all check it out. <laughs> There it is. There it is. Wonderful. Okay. And so, um, Pami commented about conceptual understanding versus memorization, and um, and then um, uh, Linda asked about people listening, kind of sitting in a circle and listening to one presenter, um, and 
can you talk more about the structure of your meetings? Is it center like that? Do you take turns? How does it work? It's about the sure. photograph um, you have up. <coughs> so every morning. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, this is actually that's actually a separate meeting, but um, so let's see. We uh, we start the day kind of setting intentions. We take some time uh, in the morning before we start. Um, then we collaboratively make a schedule um, where people add to the schedule things they want to do that day um, that concern other people. Uh, if they have personal kind of work goals, they'll just write them down themselves. They won't add it to the schedule. Um, <clears throat> And um, and we have and we have a bunch of different time um, spots and places. People put on different events. We'll put on like a planning meeting for like a long-term project that they have, um, like building a box kite or um, setting up a support group or um, or organizing like these group dinners that we put on. Um, and after we've made the schedule. Um, Everybody uses, for the most part, Trello, um, which is like a project management um, software that's online, to kind of write down their intentions for the day. Um, and then we break out into pairs, and everybody sits down. Um, and one person goes and kind of does a check-in um, about how they're doing in general, and then they will state their intentions for the day. Um, and then the other person goes. We come back into the circle, and um, and then everybody kind of says a gratitude for the day um, to start the day with some yeah you know, something nice. Um, then at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> we pull out um, computers again to uh, move our. The, the things that we have in our kind of intentions column over to the done or completed column, um, or you know the things that didn't get completed stay there, and the things that weren't um, intended at the beginning of the day that still happened to get added to the kind of completed column, um, and then we close our computers and take turns kind of reflecting on the day to talk about um, what what they felt good about that day, what really worked that day, um, what didn't work that day, um, if they would do anything different, um, whether they did the things that they set out to do, um, or if they didn't, why they didn't. Um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, and then we kind of close out from there. As for presenters, we have guest presenters um, fairly often, um, which everybody um, likes. That's something that um, that we, I really stress is that Endor is not a marketplace for content the way like a school is. It's more of a um, community where where you go and participate and you really um, get out of it what you put into it. So um, when a participant is interested in something specific, we'll help them find somebody to come in and, and present about that. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, when people come in, um, they generally get most um, participants to attend their talk or their workshop or um, or what it is. Um, and uh, I, I always kind of stress that if we're going to have people come in, they they are volunteering their time, and it's got to be positive for the person coming in and presenting. And so <clears throat> um, we're kind of cultivating a a high level of respect for the people that come in and volunteer their time, because in sometimes in years past people have come in and presented about something and felt disrespected or like people weren't listening or were like pooping off. Um, and you know I've said to them in a in a um, what I consider to be very like respectful and in a real way that. Um, if you um, if you act that way during somebody's presentation, they will feel disrespected and they're not going to want to come back. Um, um, and so that that you know to me feels really real, and and they um, usually respond to that pretty pretty well. Um, as, as Um, 
Liam we lost audio I hope you didn't drop out of the webinar I see the microphone still on by but lagging and I For say something again hmm Liam is lagging for now. Can you hear me all right? Or is it a global issue here? I cannot hear him. Okay, can you hear I me? Can hear Liam. I can't hear Liam. Okay. So Liam is, uh, okay. So let's wait for Liam to, uh, it, it happens sometimes it, uh, when the connection gets slow between two computers. So I wanted to see if it's the whole server that's slow or just uh, something on the end. end. Okay. Um, okay, he dropped out. Uh, he'll come back and uh, hopefully continue because it was an interesting part of it um, with the stories. All the stories are so fascinating how people come together and organize themselves. Um, and so, um, uh, so there, there is some discussion about, um, about terms and terminology in chat. Liam, welcome back. Uh, let me make you a moderator again so you can move between pictures if need be. And I hope you can turn the microphone there on again. I speak. There you go. Sorry, yeah, uh, sorry, gang. I don't know what happened there. Hmm. Um. So, where did you stop? Uh, you were talking about organizing people and respecting the presenters, and then uh, if um, uh, I, I want to say I, I once was invited to your group, and I, I felt great presenting there. Uh, because uh, pe people were interested and uh, everybody was lively, the questions were good, everything. That is a good endorsement. Thanks, Maria. Um, yeah. Okay. So people are talking and uh, chat about terminology, basically words that are not understood and all that. Uh, can you comment, this is one, this is one area where having a group together really shines for mathematics because of course in a group people talk and when you talk you, learn, you use terms. I mean, uh, you don't want to always say it's the thing that does the thing with the other thing. You want to, to use names. So communication mathematics change the, changes how mathematics is done. Have you noticed people kind of expand their mathematical vocabularies as they do these activities? Can you comment on that? And in general, just in your uh, terminology and learning. Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, in mathematics specifically, um, um, that's actually something that we always have a really hard time with. Uh, and when we're like going through the um, the GEB, Godel Asher box, we were constantly going back to reference kind of the glossary of terms. <clears throat> um, but um, Hmm, it just like terms in general. Um I um I don't know. I, John I has a good use. question about that and I can really relate, especially with younger children, but it's with any group. Um people tend to use their own pet names for everything. And so um uh, John asks if we need to enforce the common language or um, people, people can use their own names for things, or uh, what, what's your opinion on that one? Hmm. Um, <coughs> generally, um, 
generally, I, I don't have strong feelings about that, um, and I just kind of um, let people, um, you know, use whatever names they want, um, or um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I feel like I don't have super strong feelings about that. Uh, Sorry, I wish I had something more interesting to say. Um, well, it's interesting. Uh, people people had um, diff different opinions on that one. Um, listen, I have this one question that I ask everyone who comes to this meeting. So this is your turn now, Liam. Uh, and my okay. question is, so here we are in a group uh, and people, people of different walks of life, and there is a bigger network behind it, a natural math network, but also other people uh, who are interested in what you do. How can people help you in what you do? How can we all help you? I'm sorry, you, you dropped out for a second there. Can you say can you say that one more time? We are having log uh, spikes. Oh, yeah, because I can't hear you. Uh, yes, yes. Oh, now now I can hear. Now I can hear you, uh, Maria. Ah. Uh, I I think the question was how how can how can you help um and or um and um let's see you can help by um sharing our our uh our crowdfunding campaign um with your with your networks um you can help by if if you have anything that you ever want to present about, or if you have a workshop that you want to try on a group of people before <clears throat> um, presenting it elsewhere. Um, we have people kind of uh, Skype in with us pretty often and present about things. Um, and we have a kind of list of, of resource people that we keep um, <clears throat> that are experts in various fields. So that when participants, uh, when a participant comes and says that they, you know, want to be an instrument maker, we look at our list and, and you know, hopefully we've already got somebody that's willing to talk about that or present about that. Um, so, um, yeah, if you want to help, um, let us know what um, what you would be excited to talk to um, a teenager about. I suppose. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll try. We will try. So, uh, uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy has some stories for terminology. Um, and Linda, you disagree with something. Linda, would you like to talk about it? There is an active discussion about names in chat. Do you have a microphone today? I do, but I don't know if you can hear me. Loud and clear. Yeah, we okay. can hear you. I I was just getting ready to write in the chat that I think I understand you, that there can be more names for things so that we have, let's say, the proper name. We were talking about fractions, numerator and denominator. And I said top and bottom. And I think you're right about the cat and the hat. You can you can have some kids say what he thinks they should call them. But they they should have a name to focus on was my point. And and it doesn't have to be the big long numerator and denominator, which is <laughs> so that was all. Sure, great. Yeah, I think that's I think I'm good um chatting. I think that's good. I think that I mean anything like that that can um 
uh, that can make people feel more comfortable in the realm of mathematics, I think that's good. Um, and as long as they you know, know the terms that other people use, um, yeah, I think that's I think that's good. So, um, so uh, what uh, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about Ember and mathematics that we haven't asked you about? Do you have a question you wish we asked? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think. <clears throat> I suppose I suppose. Um, uh, we, I think we, something that we're doing right, in my opinion, is um, trying really hard not to perpetuate a kind of culture of <clears throat> of there being math people and, and not math people and that math is scary and hard. Um, so I, it's not something that I um, bring up that much, math in general. And, and when it does come up, I'm always you know, very math positive, and I'll talk about kind of different concepts. Um, but I try really hard to to kind of create an environment that is not um, math scary. There's um, there's actually there's a participant who is um, 17, and he's like his whole life he's had uh, really um, he's had a lot of trouble with spelling. And he's totally comfortable um, asking people how to spell certain words all the time um, that I'm always really impressed with um, because that's <clears throat> kind of an area where oftentimes a lot of people are embarrassed at their um, inabilities. So kind of cultivating a space where people feel comfortable um, with their kind of weaknesses and for many of them, that is around math. Um, that's something that uh, we are slowly working towards. Um, and I think once we're at the point where everybody is completely comfortable with their um, kind of self-described inadequacies around math, then um, <clears throat> we'll be able to take some big steps towards um, learning more about math. Yeah, I I think I think this culture, what you're talking about, what you talked about, what you said, what you said about the culture, it really resonates with me because I I think younger people have to build different cultures so we can have some progress in this world and the, the fact that you are building such a kind culture, accepting culture, I think it makes a difference for mathematics. I think it makes for better mathematics. It's right there. And that's the part that one of my favorite and I, I find most meaningful is in, in, in such endeavors, that there is this hope for change of the culture. So, I, uh, Liam, I'd like to thank you very much for this presentation and for many interesting thoughts. I hope people keep in touch and support your crowdfunding. There is an applause button which is hiding under the smiley face. So I'm going to click it right now and there is a little applause icon right next to my name. So we can all applaud Liam right here <laughs> through the chat and one another. Uh, thank you, everybody, for very thoughtful comments and questions. And uh, I would like to stop this recording and say, say goodbye. The recording will be on the event page in a little bit, and I will send everyone an email about it. So uh, let us keep in touch. Let us support Ender and other such initiatives. And Liam, best of success to you in what you do. Thank you so much, Maria. Thanks so much for, for having me on. This was, yeah, this was fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
mathematical terminology, and I think that makes them stumble later on with the testing in public schools. And can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Oh. I just started to record because it sounds interesting. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so when people say um, top and bottom, I do take, I, I, I want to change that because top and bottom are really relative terms depending on where you're located, and it has nothing to do with the concept of math. If teachers say the top number, it's not always the top number. It's That's a relative term. But if they would say the concept as this is how many equal pieces, and that's your denominator. Even if they don't use the term denominator, that's fine. But instead of using top and bottom, use how many equal pieces. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think when we use these terms that are not very conceptual, I think it gets more confusing for the students. Because then they think any number on top is always going to be a fraction, which isn't always true. There are so many uh, levels of precision and subtlety there. And it's one thing. I find it different when somebody who is just trying to make sense of something creates just some words like a child who, you know, slices some apples and says, oh, this parts and the number of parts. You know, that's a model of fraction. But the child is describing something they're first learning. That's very different from a kind of top-down incorrect definition. Right. And I'm, I'm not saying that they should, you should correct them and say, no, this is numerator, denominator at that level. But sometimes using just very vague terms like top and bottom, like I think I would use more questioning with them. What is, if they say the top number, I would be like, well, what, what does the top number mean to you? Do you know what I'm saying? Because I think it gets very vague when we don't expect children to get more exact on what they're trying to communicate. I think earlier someone said a thing about a thing about a thing. And that's yeah. kind of like top and bottom to me. All right. So when, when, people, start, uh, when people start with their pet names, um, it, there, is, there, there is this process of get, getting, of refining them, of uh, looking for better terms. And this process is not done for, for mathematics in general. I mean, people are still refining terminology on most of mathematics. Actually, if we try to read something even from 100 years old ago, the terminology would be pretty different. So it kind of changes all the time and gets better. I mean, I recently tried to read a Principia, and it was edited for modern times. But it's still kind of hard to read compared to modern calculus. So. Um, so it's it's very it's such a fascinating process. There is a big project in Europe. Um, Paul uh, does uh, comparing different, um, like for example, different English-speaking countries' terminologies: Australia versus UK versus Canada, US. So such a fascinating topic. Tammy, where can we find your stories? if we can find them. Well, I'm in the process. This is something that I've just started. I, I'm not really a writer, but I picked it up because I was trying to communicate my ideas, so I joined a writer's group. So they're kind of in rough draft. If anybody's interested, I can email them what I have. And it, it's more I'm just trying to, trying to peak middle age students' interest in mathematics is what I was trying to do. So I don't know if they will work, but I've just got about three. One was for very lower, like third grade, and then others were like middle level. So if anybody's interested, I can email them a copy, but I don't have any published. OK. I put my email in chat. I'd like to take a look. 
So anyway, I'm going to stop the recording again. Thank you for this conversation. And um, we can uh, we, we, we can uh, keep communicating uh, about, about our projects. Sounds like a lot of people have interest in one another's projects.